Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Um, we have Dr. Melanie Cope presenting on IPF clinical trial management. Uh, Dr. Cope is the Moran Campbell Chair and Professor in Respirology Medicine and Director of the Vision of Respirology at McMaster University. His major research interest is fibrotic lung disease with a particular interest in the role of growth factors and matrix ab um, abnormalities <laughs> in disease progression. He leads activities in bile marker development for lung fibrosis and is a principal investigator and steering committee member in numerous ILD clinical trials. Dr. Kobe has authored over 130 peer-reviewed publications on different basic science and clinical topics. He is the chief editor of the European Respirology Journal for 2018 to 2023. Dr. Kobe is also a member of the Canadian Pulmonary Fibrosis Foundation Medical Advisory Board, and he was recently named chair of the Jack Aldi Bullringer I'm chair in interlitial lung disease. So Dr. Martin Kobe, thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Sharon, and it's a pleasure to be here, pleasure to help uh, raise awareness for pulmonary fibrosis. Uh, some of you <clears throat> may have heard me before, and I think I'm a, I, I believe I'm a strong fighter for the course here and uh, for, for pulmonary fibrosis and uh, try to do this <clears throat> on different fronts in the, in the basic science lab and in collaboration with industry <clears throat> to develop new medicines. And of course, I have uh, a big uh, clinical practice as well, where I look after patients and some of you might be listening in right now. So I am talking today about uh, drug treatments for IPF. Uh, but I don't want this to be <clears throat> dry and just about drugs because there's so much more, obviously. <clears throat> drugs are just one uh, small but important element to the management of patients. I, I just want to set this <clears throat> in the larger context of uh, what we do, how we manage patients. And of course, um, I have uh, mostly scientific slides here, <laughs> but uh, I am trying to make them understandable for everyone and i'm uh, around for questions so don't don't be shy to ask questions either by the chat function the q a or uh, uh connecting with sharon so the i just want to share a patient story here and uh, i'm sure that you have had uh, similar stories that you heard of or you may have I uh, feel some of the same thing, gentlemen that I saw about three years ago, <clears throat> men uh, who had shortness of breath on strenuous exertion, had a bit cough, no other symptoms really. And then he had these crackly sounds on the chest that we hear, <clears throat> normal blood pressure, heart rate. So he was otherwise pretty healthy, really just a bit reflux, acid reflux. And his uh, breathing test showed that the lungs were a bit smaller than they should be. And... I always show these pictures to my patients who know me and uh, I tell them uh, what is fibrosis here and you will probably have seen CT scans and we look at normal lung tissue looking like this here which is kind of these darkish uh, gray uh, And you see these lines that branch like branches of a tree. Those are blood vessels, air tubes. And you see how these things get smaller and smaller when you come to the outside. Now, here are some spots where this pattern is disturbed. So you see much more thickened thicken stuff here at the outside. This is what we call reticulation. And this is where we have some scar tissue. Now, this gentleman was offered to get a biopsy done, but he didn't feel much. He wasn't too fond of someone taking a piece of his lungs, which is fair enough. And we kept observing him, but he got worse over two years. Uh, again, the patients of your caregivers may have experienced similar things from your own uh, experience. And he uh, was worse with his 
assertion level, so and the dry cough was pretty much unchanged. And now, what he has uh, in those two years, the breathing volume in his uh, lungs uh, dropped by about 440 million. So that's about a pint of air in you, if you look in the volumes. And his CT scan now uh, shows that these thick lines at the outside of the lungs are more extensive. And this is uh, including some spots that we describe as honeycombing and traction bronchiectasis. So this is a relatively typical picture for someone <clears throat> with IPF. Um, I always... And that room is getting full of spider webs in the corners of that room. And these spider webs will never go away. Um, the more uh, dense these spider webs will get, and the more they will invade into this room, the smaller will be the space where you can walk in. And this is literally <clears throat> what you would have uh, as breathing volume. And this is what we measure with this magic vital capacity, which is basically when we ask a patient to take a deep breath as much as they can and then breathe it all out as quickly as they can. And that amount of volume, that's, that's the vital capacity. And obviously, if you have more spider webs around this uh, room's corner, the walkable room uh, space will get smaller. And uh, in the lungs, the volume gets slower and the lungs get more stiff and the patient feels breathless. Now, um, <clears throat> this gentleman that was treated with antifibrotics after getting uh, information about it, he took nintedonib <clears throat> because of COVID, we couldn't really do much in terms of repeat breathing tests. And then suddenly it got worse without much warning. It took just a week or two that he felt really bad. He was breathless at rest and he had no fever. COVID testing was negative. <clears throat> and what you can see here now in these CT scans is that the scarring is still here. And now you see these spots that have a, a, a hazy texture, right? So it's not as dark gray as here. It's not as bright white as these thick lines. It's kind of this haziness. <clears throat> and this is what we call ground glass opacity. So this poor gentleman had developed <clears throat> and flare and acute exacerbation. And about two weeks later, you see how this involved the whole lungs uh, of this man and uh, unfortunately, uh, he passed away. So this is one of the things that you fear as a patient uh, that you don't like. Of course, when the, thing, when the lungs shrink progressively, your volumes that you can breathe go down. <clears throat> and then you have these uh, events that co are called exacerbations, uh, which we always uh, uh, tell you to let us know as soon as you feel bad, right? So this is really what we are tackling, and this is what we're tackling with medicines and drugs as well. Now, you may know some of these uh, folks here. Uh, we're all heavily involved in the foundation work. So this is our foundation founder, <clears throat> Robert Davidson. Um, and uh, this is Stephen Binch, and this is Barbara Barr. Uh, sadly, all three have now moved on because of either their disease or post-lung transplantation. But, you know, they always liked me to put their pictures up. This was actually a fun fundraising event a couple of years ago where we played basketball <clears throat> with uh, Nick Stauskas from the NBA. And it was there was really a great turnout with a couple of hundred people there. I think Sharon was there. There was really great, a great, great fundraising event. Uh, sadly, we can't do that right now with COVID, but... Uh, Happy to do it again. So anyway, so I just want to put a few of the questions that you may have into these phases. And obviously, if you read about it, and I do this every time I get a new patient, um, you read this 50-50 chance of dying within three to four years. Yeah. So this is obviously <clears throat> not a very nice uh, piece of information. And so you want to make sure that the doctors should that you have this disease so that you can plan accordingly. Then this is what we're talking about mostly today. <clears throat> is there anything there to make me live longer? So what about therapies? And uh, Robert, in the end, he said I had a relatively good run. Uh, he feels it got worse. And then uh, at that point, it's really much more about <clears throat> preserving quality of life. Yeah, so we'll address those three things very briefly. Yep. Uh, how do we make a diagnosis? To, and then how we, do we treat it? And I really will not focus today much on, on these uh, 
symptom uh, uh, approaches, but happy to address questions as well, right? So you know that fibrosis, IPF uh, and other types of fibrosis makes a long string. So they get smaller and they get stiffer. You feel that by getting breathless and we can measure that by uh, measuring the amount of air that you can breathe in and out. And we have uh, heard about these really bad episodes of acute exacerbations. We <clears throat> know this is not the most common disease, but it is also not that uncommon. And a rare disease as defined by governments would be something that's affecting less than 50 per 100,000, which is true for IPF in the whole population, but most of the patients involved are uh, a bit more uh, in the older age range. So under 50 would be quite unusual. And most patients are really 60, 65 and higher. <clears throat> and in that it affects about 200 per 100,000. So that's not rare at all. And a family doctor would through his lifetime have certainly a number of patients uh, affected by this disease. Excuse and me, somebody yeah. wants to know, why do you only refer to IPF? Because um, this patient has um, PF. Uh, it, yeah, I think the answer is right now here. <laughs> oh, okay. So, so I, uh, so the IPF is is sort of the prototype of these disorders. But you're totally correct, and this pie chart breaks it down. So it, it, there are many different types of pulmonary fibrosis. We are often referring to IPF primarily because this is the disease where we know most about, and particularly when it's about drug treatments. That's the disease that is studied by far the best. Yeah, but there are a lot of the <clears throat> other types of pulmonary fibrosis. We do somewhat an extrapolation, uh, which is uh, right in many ways, but it's not a one-to-one -one extrapolation. But when we talk about fibrosis, it's really quite similar what you see in IPF lungs and in the other types of pulmonary fibrosis. But totally correct that about in, in a clinic like mine or Dr. Fells or, or Dr. Shapiro's and Ryas and, and uh, in these specialty clinics, IPF is about a quarter of what we do. Yeah, so that means three quarter of patients have other diseases. Uh, they have some differences in approach, uh, but uh, in once fibrosis drives the problem, uh, they are quite similar in the end. Yeah, and in fact, uh, this is just just to make you really Confused now, uh, not on purpose, but that's what it is. Yeah, so there are really about 200 types of diseases in this group that we call interstitial lung disease, as opposed to airway disease um, or pulmonary vascular disease. And uh, we often put a lot of effort in getting the proper name to your disorder so that we manage it rightly. And we measure how much Air can you take in with a deep breath? So this is really a measure of the volume of the lungs. Yeah, just remember that room <clears throat> with the spider web, so without. And then they measure something that a lot of patients don't like because it takes some time and needs some breath holds. That's the measurement of how well does a gas, oxygen in real life, or carbon monoxide in our labs, <clears throat> uh, how well does that travel from the air space into the blood space? So those are the two tests that we do very commonly in order to determine if someone gets worse, if someone is stable, or if a drug therapy is uh, effective or not. And we looked at these pictures. So, so I always spend a lot of time with my patients, look at these pictures, and you see again these areas of spiderweb formations or reticulation with these honeycomb-like uh, areas. Yeah? So, and a lot of healthy lung tissue is, is also present, so this is why why there's still a good amount of activity left. And uh, of course, Steve um, had this question at the very beginning. He actually lived for longer than his three to four years, but he had the same question at the beginning. <clears throat> and on average, these numbers are still true. Uh, these numbers are all from a time prior to the first approval of drugs for lung fibrosis. Um, we're currently updating this study, but uh, I also tell my patients, this applies to a whole group of patients. And, uh, it's helpful for someone like me or someone like Sharon, uh, and the average time that someone lives with this disease is in fact in that low range. 
but it is never possible to extrapolate that to a person right? because one person could easily live 10, 15 years and longer with it and some other individuals uh, uh, have a very rapid decline and live much shorter. Yeah, and they come much later into a clinical practice. Yeah, so don't don't overread this these numbers, and because uh, they they don't mean anything for an individual that reads it. Yeah, but of course that brings IPF really quite similar to to what we know about cancer. And I don't want to make you afraid of this, but of course this is a slide <clears throat> that we often use when we speak to politicians or policy makers um, who don't know much about disease like pulmonary fibrosis. And they should really know that this is not any different uh, than cancer in the survival. So every politician would know about colon cancer, breast cancer, kidney cancer, <clears throat> uh, but they would always be super surprised when I say, well, this disease is worse than cancer. I mean, there are some cancers of course that are, even worse than IPF, but that, that's a slide that we use a lot to, to provide awareness. So basically says, yes, we need drugs. Yes, we need therapies. And yes, we need to do clinical trials. <clears throat> this is what I'm going to focus on now uh, for a little while. So what about therapies? <clears throat> and <clears throat> so for the uh, folks in the audience who are interested in a clinical trial, and I'm interested in how, how do we actually find out how a drug works or whether a drug works or not. This can only be done reliably in what we call a randomized clinical trial, which means you have a group of participants. So we approach them typically. We ask, are you interested in doing a clinical trial? So I, uh, I am usually quite casual. I ask my patients if they want to be a guinea pig and uh, my patients usually like it. Of course, those are high level guinea pigs and uh, there's much more safety checks uh, in our clinical trial world. But it, essentially a, a group of volunteers, participants with a disease is assigned to an intervention group. That's the patients who would get the no drug and a control group that would be a patients who get either no drug or no drug, but usually placebo. And then in the end, you compare the outcomes. So ideally in that intervention group with a new drug, you will have more smiley faces here uh, and uh, then in the placebo group, which means that this intervention is better than the placebo. And that would be a, an outcome where a, a regulator, a government says, yes, you have proven that this works and we approve this uh, drug or in this intervention for therapy. Now, randomization is not done locally. So um, we usually, it's just a computer program that randomly assigns a patient to one group or the other. So no one really has any influence about this. And patients often ask that. Yeah, obviously a patient in a trial would much more prefer to be on the drug arm than in the placebo arm. Um, but this is all random and no one knows. Yeah, so a computer will tell a study site which group a patient is assigned to. And then the study site uh, will no not know about it because it's double blind, right? So <clears throat> basically the patient doesn't know what they get and the doctor and the study coordinator also don't know what they get. So this is what's called a double blind randomized clinical trial. So no one knows who gets what. And that's very important because obviously a patient who is volunteering for a clinical trial or a doctor who's conducting a clinical trial wants this new drug to work. And if you are starting with that expectation and you know you have the new drug as opposed to having a placebo, you will automatically feel better right? because you know you're doing something. And that is why these trials are always blinded. Now, it's not that blind. So it's not that no one checks. Uh, and I want the listeners to be sure that um, there are a lot of safety checkpoints all the time. 
in real time, literally. So when we do a clinical trial, we get constantly notification about side effects that were observed and uh, side effects in the whole trial. So related to the drug or not, but there is a committee that is called the Data Safety Monitoring Committee. And those are a group of experts who see the information in an unblinded way. So they know exactly who gets, gets which drug and they make sure that this intervention is safe for the patients. Once a, an intervention is unsafe, then this data safety monitoring committee has the power to recommend a termination of this trial if they think this is a too dangerous intervention. Yeah, so there are a lot of checkpoints <clears throat> that are done behind the scenes because the most important thing about all these clinical trials is that the patients and volunteers in these trials have to be very safe. Okay, so you know, these slides just give you a little bit of hint of how complex it is. And this complexity and the duration that we need in order to test these new drugs is the reason why new drugs are always pretty expensive because it costs a lot of money <clears throat> to do all this and to do uh, all these uh, uh, investigations in a proper and safe way. So all these trials have caused us to find a so-called standard of care for IPF. This is another uh, one of my patients, Gerard. He had IPF. <clears throat> and we know that immunosuppressive drugs such as prednisone or cyclophosphamide, which were used historically for IPF, are, don't have a place in this disease. Antifibrotic drugs do, and, and the acid medications or like reflux medication do as well. This applies to IPF in other disorders that could cause pulmonary fibrosis, such as the person who asked the question to Sharon, steroids might well be useful at the beginning of the disease. Once the disease is more advanced, they may become less useful. Yeah, but there are distinctions between the types of, of, um, of pulmonary fibrosis that an individual has. So for IPF, it's a no to prednisone, at least higher doses. For other diseases, if you have hypersensitivity pneumonitis or rheumatoid arthritis <clears throat> or another autoimmune disease, then this is quite different. But the drug development that is currently pursued is really much more focused on the antifibrotics in all these conditions, not so much on the anti-inflammatories. And here you see why we talk about IPF so much, because the last 20, 25 years really were characterized by studying IPF. And these circles just reflect how sizable a clinical trial is. So these big circles are about 800 patients uh, and smallest circles are between 150 and 250, 300 patients. You see how many? studies were done and how many patients were really studied over the last 25 years in this field. And this is how we learned about this disease so much. One thing we learned is that we should find it if we can early and we should intervene early because you will not regain lost lung function, right? So once your lungs are shrinking, you don't get them bigger again. So the best you can do with current medicines is just stop it from getting worse at the point when you begin. So this is very important to know. <clears throat> and we also know that a patient typically loses about 200 to 250 milliliter in breathing volume per year. You remember that patient story I had shared at the beginning, that gentleman lost about 500, so about a pint in two years. So this is exactly what the disease does. If you get older and you don't have the disease, you lose much less. You just use about, lose about a shot glass worth of volume per year. Yeah, so a shot glass versus a half a pint, that's quite a difference if you do this year by year. So this is really where our drug development aims at. Yeah, so uh, this is the primary outcome for all these clinical trials. And these trials that I showed you have led to this treatment uh, recommendation, which is 
an international grouping, American Thoracic Society, European, Japanese, and this uh, Latin American. So they all agreed that you should consider treatment with nitidinib, profenidone, and anti-reflux medication in, in a good number of patients. Some of these drugs uh, were tested and were found to be either dangerous or not useful. And obviously oxygen and lung transplantation is something that, um, so lung transplantation for a selected few, and oxygen is, is common sense that this helps someone. And so reflux medication was not tested in a, in a randomized clinical trial, but from big centers like this one in San Francisco or others, we have learned that patients who are on reflex medication have less often uh, these acute flares, these acute exacerbations, and may live longer. So that's why a lot of patients would be on anti-reflux medication. You may ask why didn't this get tested the same way as the other drugs? Uh, simple answer, because they're way too cheap, these drugs. So an, uh, a month supply of a, uh, a, a pantoprazole or something, that's just $20, $30. And of course, uh, one of these trials that I'm going to show you will cost about $100 million, one of them. Yeah, so if, if you can't really uh, make any any uh, money as a company, you would likely not invest that much uh, into it. So only governments could could uh, finance these studies. Yeah, that's why this was not really tested. And the, so, so th those are the slopes of curves that we are looking at in this field. So those are basically the num the volume that you lose in one year here, so 52 weeks, when you are on a drug, perfenidone or nintedonib, that's the upper curves, or when you are in the placebo arm. And you see that about 200, 300 milliliter is what you lose per year when you are in a placebo arm, so you don't get a drug. If you get perfenidone or nintedonib, <clears throat> you lose about half of it. And you still lose something, but it's not as quick. And obviously, there is only so much you can lose until the lungs stop functioning. Then uh, we would, uh, of course, assume that you live longer when you take these medicines. And that's, that's why, why we really recommend taking them as long as you tolerate them. A perfenidone is a small molecule, a small uh, a chemical molecule that is easily packaged into a pill. <clears throat> and what this drug does, it is interferes with cells called fibroblasts. These fibroblasts are the cells that make scar tissue in the body. So if you cut yourself uh, on the finger and the hand somewhere or get a, get a cut on your forehead, <clears throat> In the end, you need your fibroblasts just to tie that up, yeah? just to make a, a, a homemade suture, yeah? which can sometimes look ugly, <laughs> or it can look in a way that you almost not don't see it, right? So normally, these fibroblasts do the job, and then they disappear once the job is done, so once the wound is closed. In individuals who get fibrosis, and that is true for IPF and for other types of pulmonary fibrosis, this process of scar formation just does not stop. So these fibroblasts keep, keep doing what they are taught to do, but they don't stop. That's what they also usually taught to do, but in the disease, they don't do it. And this is where drugs like pyrphenidone, so they make them stop doing it. And the Pyrphenidone uh, studies clearly have shown that when you reduce this loss of lung shrinking, you improve mortality. Yeah, so you live longer if someone stops your lung function to, to, to shrink. So this is very important because regulators like Health Canada or the FDA, they want, of course, before they approve a new drug, they want to know, so do you just change a number? which is one thing that you can do with statistics, but does that mean anything to a patient? 
Right? Because they will always tell us, yes, your drug intervention doesn't make a patient feel much better. Yeah, in fact, some feel worse because they have side effects. So the regulators will ask us, do, does, does that patient at least live longer? <clears throat> and this is what is shown in this graph here. So yes, we know now if you affect that one number, we affect mortality on average. And what governments also want to know is with your intervention, do you do something to hospitalizations? So does a patient who is on a drug like pifenidone or nintedanib need hospitalization less frequently as a patient who is not on these drugs, uh, which you see here. So hospitalizations related to breathing trouble in this trial was less which for a government means, yes, if I can keep my patients outside of the hospital, for one, it's quality of life because no one wants to be in the hospital. So patients will feel better on average. <clears throat> and knowing how costly it is to be in a hospital um, with probably a cost of about $1,000 per day, if not more, uh, hospitals uh, uh, drive costs and the government will say, well, if you keep my patients, my people outside of the hospital, uh, with an expensive drug, uh, we save money on that one front, so it's justified to pay it at the other side. Yeah, so this is something that's very important for a government and also very important for a patient's perspective. Now, nintetanib is a, a different drug, it's also a pill. And you see again these word fibroblasts, so they this drug literally does um, also attack these fibroblasts and the way how they make scar tissue uh, in, in a different way from a, from, a, from a biology perspective. So I don't want to talk about that in detail. So this very different to perfenidone, but fundamentally it also works on that, on that scar formation. And you see, again, this is the slope. That's the loss of lung function over time. And in these big trials, sometimes we see an effect between the drug and the placebo arm after three months already. That doesn't mean that a patient would feel it because these are just averages of four or 500 patients. So you have a lot of data points in these. For a single patient, it doesn't mean anything. Yeah? So you would never be giving up on a drug before a year is over or two even, unless you don't tolerate it. Yeah? Because an individual will not feel what you see in these graphs. And again, sometimes we need to tell regulators and politicians uh, that these numbers are statistics, they are not people. Yeah, I mean, yes, they are made out of individual people, but you can extrapolate what you see in these graphs to a single person. Yeah, so with other words, a government could not shut us down after three months when we don't show that something is not working because it's just impossible. Yeah, and... We also have learned from these trials, and that's very important, that it doesn't matter how sick you are. So if you have, this is the vital capacity. So this is how much air you can breathe. It's less than 90% of what you should. This is more than 90%. So these folks are probably feeling nothing of their disease. <clears throat> we just see it on an image. These ones would be patients who feel something, but you see that even if you don't feel anything, you lose about 200 milliliter per year. And that's the gentleman I showed you before. He didn't feel much, but he lost that amount. And yeah, that's really true across the border. If you intervene with these medicines, you reduce that loss of lung function. So even if you don't feel anything, this drug makes you having lungs that shrink less quickly. And obviously it will take much more time until you feel something. Yeah, so that's, that's an effect that is important that I always tell my patients about. And then a lot of patients and even doctors would be worried that these drugs may lose efficacy after a given time. Yeah, so it may just like wane, wane and wax. So, so they stop working after a year or two or three. Yeah, so some patients will say, well, I wanna wait until I really need it. Right now I don't feel anything because they may not work at a later time point. And that's by all we know not true. So we have done trials up to four years now. 
And it seems as if this slope is the same all the time, right? So you see over, over these, I mean, this is three years here. You lose about 300. A patient without drug would be at the bottom of the slide here in that time period. You know, they would have lost about 600 in this time period, uh, which obviously is a good success <clears throat> of these medicines as long as you tolerate them. Then some patients wonder if the presence of emphysema, because this is a common disease in smokers, a lot of patients with <clears throat> different types of fibrosis have smoked as well. That would affect how these drugs work. Bottom line, it does not. So patients with emphysema or no emphysema, the drug treatment, the dark blue versus the placebo is always doing better. So that is something that is not a factor. You're very severe. <clears throat> We sometimes add drugs. So this is where we do new trials now. So we use one drug plus a second drug. So this drug may be known to some people as a drug that is used to treat erectile dysfunction. That's called Viagra. It's the same thing, but it's also used to treat pulmonary hypertension, which means high blood pressure in the lungs. And that's a problem that often comes in patients with IPF or other types of pulmonary fibrosis when they get more severe. Yeah, so when they get more sick, they get this pulmonary hypertension. So we asked the question, does the combination of a fibrosis and a pulmonary vessel drug help patients how they, how they do? And uh, it actually is a combination that is well tolerated by the patients. And it's a combination here that makes survival or loss of lung function less likely. So uh, it, the importance of this trial was really that this was a trial that looked at very sick patients. So they were all on oxygen pretty much, and they were all very severely impaired. And we treated them with two drugs in this experimental setting. We rarely can prescribe those two drugs at the same time because sildenafil is not approved for IPF. It's only approved if you have pulmonary hypertension alone, or if you have scleroderma and pulmonary hypertension. But it's important study because it showed us that we can safely uh, uh, offer these trials to patients who have more severe disease. And obviously, if you're more sick, uh, you are much more inclined to do something about your disease, uh, even if it may not work necessarily, but you want to take some action or just like uh, fold into your uh, fate, right? So the safety, as I said before, is extremely important for all these trials. And uh, we know that perfenidone and intidonib are very, very safe drugs. So you hardly ever see anything dangerous in terms of side effects, which is quite different to uh, drugs like prednisone or, or cyclophosphamide. But the ones who took it or taking it, they know for sure that you can have diarrhea and that can be quite annoying and quite difficult, sometimes even causing dehydration, which then tells us you can't use this drug. Or if any, don't often causes nausea, fatigue and decreased appetite, or it can cause these nasal skin rashes. But those are all things that are often manageable in real life. But what it also shows us together with what I showed you before, for one, despite being on these drugs, you still decline more than you should. So it doesn't stop, it just slows it down. And this side effect uh, information shows that there is room for doing better, right? So you want, even if, if a drug would not be any better than intedonipifenidone in how they work uh, and what they do, if they would be better tolerated, that would be great. Because, right? of course, you, you don't like to take a drug that makes you feel bad, even if you makes, makes you feel longer. Right? Uh, Dr. Kobe, there's two questions. Mm -hmm. uh, one of them is a patient who is an IPF patient was wondering if they should take Panazo for their GERD. Uh, so, uh, yeah, you know, that is a... You should ask your, your doctor, of course, right? But my patients, who when they have reflux symptoms. So when they feel heartburn or something or kind of a lot of burping, uh, 
uh, or when they have um, a lot of cough, dry cough, I would typically treat them with a drug like pentoprazole. Okay. Um, but not everyone would do it. So, so but it, I mean, some some uh, doctors with pulmonary who treat pulmonary fibrosis are very liberal and they give them to pretty much all the patients. But if you have symptoms, then I, I would give it, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. And the second question, uh, Dr. Kolb, is that um, you're talking about the drug natinidum, and apparently right now it's been approved for all pulmonary fibrosis patients. Mm -hmm. But why is it that only the folks that are IPF um, can get coverage for it and the rest can't. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the, that's one of the things that we, are, we are all working very hard on, including uh, Sharon and the CPFF. So uh, it's, uh, you know, it's, this is, uh, I mean, it's true. So uh, uh, Nintedonib was tested for IPF at first, and then because of the need of looking at the other types of pulmonary fibrosis, it was also tested for these other types. And it was shown in one of these trials, as I described them, that it works for these people as well. Um, other drugs may have their place in other diseases at the beginning, but once they are behaving like IPF, like one of the patients I showed you, these drugs work. Now, Health Canada has approved Nintedonib for this indication about a year and a half ago. And that's just the first step. So basically Health Canada says, yes, it's safe to use these drugs. Yes, it works. And then it goes to the provinces and the provinces would then negotiate with the companies if they are covered, if there's a need and how much do they pay. And that typically takes about a year, give or take, after approval. So we had now a year full of COVID, and I'm sure that the people in the Ministry of Health were working very hard to handle the pandemic. And it may have caused that delay, but we literally wait for these drugs to get approval uh, any day now. But I, I don't know exactly where they are, but it's it's longer than usual. But of course, we had, of course, a health crisis that was unprecedented. And people who usually work in this field have had other stuff to do, right? Private insurers partly pay it already. And of course, if someone is uh, wealthy enough to afford it, we could prescribe it because we are allowed to prescribe it. Yeah, but I, I hope, I truly hope basically every week that uh, there is some good news from the provincial governments. Okay, thank you. Um, another question is um, actually this this person, if they wanted to, they can just go back to our website and look at the um, generic antifibrotics because they want to know if the generic uh, profenadone is as good as the original Esprit. Um, so I would say likely. <laughs> But uh, I mean, that's what generics do, right? So a generic is, uh, a, a generic manufacturer has to show that their drug does the same thing in a cell culture dish, uh, that the drug does the same thing in terms of how it's taken up from the intestines when you swallow it as a pill or, or uh, if it's an injection, how it's distributed in the body. And it, they have to show that it's safe and doesn't cause any damage to the liver or kidney or bone marrow. And they have done all this. What a generic manufacturer does not have to do is they don't have to do these clinical trials that I talked about, and I'm going into the new clinical trials in a, in a minute. And this is why they are much cheaper, right? So because the drug development, the cost for drug development is really ramping up once you are at that stage where you need to test a drug in a patient because you need to have put all these safety measures in place and you have to do all these tests and you have to do them regularly. So this is immensely costly. So all these trials that I showed you, say this inspiration, uh, this impulsive trial or the in-stage trial or the ascent trial, each of these trials easily cost about a hundred million dollars just to do it. Yeah, so they're hugely costly, these trials. 
<clears throat> and the generic manufacturer just they don't have this the cost, so they just do the the inexpensive tests. And yes, they have usually good quality products, they which are likely working as good as the the brand name, um, but they save money at other fronts and. You know, if it were just about generic manufacturers, we would not have a new drug at all. No, because they piggyback basically on on what others have done and have invested in. Yeah, but I, if you take that generic as uh, perfenidone from, uh, I think only Sandoz perfenidone is on the market now. <clears throat> I would just trust that this works as well as Espria did. Okay. Um, another patient wanted to ask you, um, you know, what, if you're taking one of these drugs and <clears throat> the side effects that you uh, had uh, clearly demonstrated, um, for example, this person has taken nitinidum. Um, they, they took it in the morning and took it at night, but they were having some severe, you know, uh, side effects to it. And they were wondering, um, you know, cause they went back down just one dose a day. Um, do you think that they should try to go back up to two dose a day? Um, so, so, I mean, very difficult to give really uh, customized advice here. Uh, in principle, one dose a day would not give you enough drug exposure. So you would, if you get, if it gets below 100 milligram twice a day, <clears throat> you would likely not have enough drug exposure. So that's, that's all we know that you need 100 or 150 to get enough tissue levels to be working. So if, if you can just tolerate one pill a day or every other day. Um, I think you're not really doing anything good to you. You're just uh, struggling with side effects for no good right. reason. Yeah, but I but I, I think this would be a question that you should should you should address directly because it it needs other pieces of information that that I don't have. Okay, thank you, Dr. Cope, because they said that they are on 150, but I think you're right that they should probably consult with their own respirologist. Uh, yeah, so if you are one, on 150, <clears throat> one a day, I would think that you should be going to 100 twice a day rather than 150 one a day. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I, I, I hope I didn't torture you too much with <laughs> this slide hanging in there for too long because... Obviously, this is this is how uh, sometimes the side effects feel, yeah. And this is how I often <clears throat> describe it to my patients. And uh, then a patient is really encouraged to, to pick the drug of their choice or pick the side effect of their choice, yeah? because there some people are having an easier time to deal with with uh, diarrhea, and others have an easier time to deal with nausea. Uh, and you can address it through lifestyle changes and, and uh, of course, um, gravel and, and Imodium and, and stuff like that. Yeah, but it's, it's often a patient preference. Now, we clearly have learned that patients want these drugs. Doctors are sometimes a bit hesitant. Um, I use this slide a lot to convince doctors that, well, if it doesn't matter what you want, I have shown you that they work in patients with mild disease. And if you survey patients with this disease, they said, yes, I want to try these drugs. Yeah, at, at least the, the majority wants to try these drugs. It's not at all that I'm a drug pusher. I, I will never, never agree to that statement, but I would want a patient to get uh, access to drugs that are approved, that we know work, and uh, they should know about the side effects and the risks of taking a drug and then a decision about starting treatment or not is, I, th I think, always made together. You know I mean, the doctor and the patient together would, would be the best position to make a decision about starting a drug or not. Now, this is now looking really complicated and uh, I promise you it is complicated because this is literally showing you how scar formation works uh, on, the, on the microscopic levels. Yeah, so you have uh, a number of different cells here, air tube cells, bronchial cells, those are alveolar cells through the lining on the, in the air sacs. They are fibroblasts, we heard about those guys. We have blood vessels in the lungs. We have this scar tissue, so this is collagen fibers. Uh, so a lot of complexity 
in this disorder and all these different acronyms here, uh, he picked a new drug that targets one of these players. So pulmonary fibrosis, and that applies to IPF and all other types of fibrosis, have different elements here being overactive. So all these elements in isolation are normal because you need wound healing, you need scar tissue to survive. But normally these fibroblasts, it's called apoptosis. Once the job is done, they undergo apoptosis. In short, they kill themselves once they, they're not needed anymore because the job is done, I don't have anything to do. So they undergo apoptosis, commit suicide. And they don't do that in fibrosis. So, and a lot of these normal processes go wrong. And you see just these numerous compounds that are tested in clinical trials because drug developers know just as patients and doctors that there is still progression despite approved therapies and the approved therapies are not working in everyone. And they are on top of it, sometimes not tolerated. So there's a lot of need and you see that drug developers have picked that up and um, you just see that big list of drugs that are currently in clinical trials. So human guinea pig trials, if you want. Yeah, in phase two or three, clinical trials, so those are the larger trials between uh, 40 to 800 patients. Yeah, so a lot of these different compounds uh, are currently in clinical development. And you may ask, uh, are they available for patients in Canada? And uh, would they be promising or not? So in the last little while, there were a lot of failures, like all the time. So for instance, it was tested if antibiotics, septra, that's called cotrimoxazole, work in patients with IPF. Um, and it wasn't really uh, uh, very convincing uh, that they worked. There's a marginal difference between them, but it didn't really work well. So this was a negative clinical trial. Then there's another one with septra or doxycycline, that was a negative clinical trial. And there is now a number of trials that were a bit more promising. So this was a company done by a company called Galapagos. That's an, it's called an autotaxin inhibitor. This is another one of these molecules that are involved in this fibroblast activity. So this trial was very promising. Uh, to a degree that they did a huge clinical trial with about aiming for about 1600 patients. So a tremendously big trial. Uh, just to give you a flavor, the, my cost estimate for that trial is easily $150 million to conduct it. And that trial was stopped in the meantime because of likely a safety concern. So one of the safety check points that I told you about, this data safety monitoring committee has probably seen a signal that looked like patients might be at risk. Um, and the faintest signal here is usually causing one of these trials to get stopped. So we, there's nothing really public as beyond what I've just said. So no one knows exactly what happened here, but it is uh, to the credit of the company here, they listened to the safety check and they stopped the trial immediately and they now analyze what did, did was there anything wrong with this compound or with the target or what, I mean, so, so really just to put safety of patients above anything else. And another trial, it's called Pentraxin. This is an infusion that was also published already. And again, I was a promising clinical trial and this trial is now recruiting uh, subjects as well as they recruit them in, uh, in Canada. Uh, another study that molecule targets connective tissue growth factor. Again, this is a factor that is in the lungs that would stimulate fibroblasts to make more scar tissue. Also got these slopes. Yeah, so this is a good slope. This is the drug, this is the, this is the placebo. So that's a trial that we would call promising. 
So it needs a bigger trial. So this was a trial of maybe 100, 120 patients, give or take. Yeah, so yeah, exactly 101. <clears throat> so now we need a bigger trial with about four or 500 patients at least to show if it works or not. Yeah, and those are the costly ones. Yeah, so. Oh, sorry to interrupt. Yep. Yeah. We've got someone want to ask you, are all these clinical trials for all these drugs, is their aim to, to cure people with pulmonary fibrosis or, or is their aim to allow the patient to live with the disease? Uh, yes, I think a, a cure is very ambitious uh, word. So you can cure a pneumonia. Uh, you can probably not cure diabetes. You take drugs and you do lifestyle changes to live with it, right? Uh, you cannot cure pulmonary fibrosis, but you can make it stop and then learn how to live with it at the time when you stop it. That's why we always say you should start treatment as early as possible or as you wish, because once you have lost a certain amount of function, you can't regain it. Yeah, so stopping progression is really what we are currently aiming for. Yeah, improving things. That's probably uh, uh, tuned for the for the future, for the likely distant future. Yeah, but most people would say, well, if it at least stops now, that's manageable. All right. So this is really what we aim for. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. And so, so we need we are aware that we need to combine drugs, right? So you could combine the drugs that are approved, perfenidone and tetanib. They're both approved. Of course, the government covers only one. Uh, but in an ideal world, you would say, well, the one drug stops your progression by 50%. The other drug stops your progression by 50%. So do the math, 50 plus 50 is 100. When I take both, it stops. That's a good assumption. You just have to show that this is the case, right? So now, what you also have to show is that if you combine this one with that one, it's safe enough. So does that add toxicity or cause your liver to be damaged? Or of course, if you already have nausea and weight loss here and you get diarrhea and weight loss there, is that manageable from a side effect profile, right? So uh, you can combine those two. It's safe enough. It, it's reasonably tolerable. Does it work better? We don't know because no one did these costly studies yet that show if the combination works better. But what is done is to test these new drugs on top of old drugs or to test new drugs in patients who did not tolerate the old drugs and see if they are better. And this is uh, the red circle. Those are all trials that are uh, going on in Canada right now. And two of these trials have in the meantime stopped. Yeah, the first one is the, the one where I just showed you from Galapagos that has been terminated. Uh, that other compound down there, which is called PVI 4050, the company has made internal decisions that they don't want to pursue this any further. So it leaves us, to my knowledge, with those four drugs that are currently uh, enrolling in Canada. And uh, I have just put some information in here. So all these trials that are new have to be registered with a website, mostly the one that is on the US uh, NIH. Uh, so, so the, um, uh, the National Clinical Trial Registry. So they have these NCT numbers. So if you type this number into a Google search, you'll find that trial. You will know exactly who, how this trial is, what it is. Yeah, so this is, uh, this is an oral compound that looks targets um, structures that are called integrins. Again, I don't want to give you too much details, but it's an oral compound. It's a first, it's an earlier clinical trial. And in Canada, you have three sites here. There's one in, one in Toronto, one in Windsor, and uh, we are in Hamilton. So this is a trial that has uh, started in Canada. Galecto, this is an inhaler actually. It's one of the few trials that look at inhaled drugs. 
a much bigger trial. They look for 500 participants. And uh, uh, some of the sites with this trial are uh, in, uh, in Hamilton, we do one, there's one in Windsor, again, <clears throat> actually two in Windsor and uh, in, in Toronto. Yeah, so this would be a, a study that you could participate in. And then is a study that has just started <clears throat> in, so it says basically not yet recruiting, which means that these uh, centers are still working on on setting up the, the trial and doing ethics approval and contracting. Yeah, but this, again, this is a study that looks at an oral compound from bristol myers Squibb, <clears throat> looking at 360 participants. Typically, this would be done in about 100 sites worldwide. And you see here a few in Canada that would be in Vancouver, <clears throat> in Toronto, Montreal, and uh, Sherbrooke. Yeah, so this uh, would be um, a study that is available. And if you look at this number, you could find the contact information and you would know exactly which site uh, that is. Right now it's just this one site, zero, one, two, three, four. Uh, but if you look at them and, and you will find exactly which person that would be. Uh, Dr. Cope, uh, mm -hmm. what people want to know, do you have to live in the city where they're doing this clinical trials or can you live somewhere else and still participate? Uh, you know, that's, in theory, you can live someone else, somewhere else, but uh, of course these trials typically need a patient to come in quite regularly to a visit. So, because it, we need to make sure that we monitor for safety. So the first three months, you probably have to come like three, four times. Yeah, at the beginning, after two weeks, after four weeks, after eight weeks, and then after every three months for a year's time. So often when you live too far away, it's probably not feasible. Um, so let's say if you are in North Bay and you want to do a study in Toronto, it's probably doable. Yeah. So if if you if you if you're used to like the using the travel grants for for getting medical care already, so often trials would be able to even reimburse for that travel. Yeah. But if it's too far away, it's probably too cumbersome. Okay. Uh, Dr. Cope, someone asks, is also asking, uh, they, you know, they've been part of a clinical trial before, but why was it that the drug would come out first in either Europe or in the US, but not in Canada? Uh, you know, very simple that the bigger markets uh, for a drug company are, the biggest markets is the US usually, where they make the most revenue. Uh, and Europe is obviously much bigger than Canada, and they have a pan-European drug approval, uh, so which covers, of course, a big population. So uh, knowing how much paperwork is required for a regulatory agency to, to approve a drug and test and look at all this evidence, and they look at it into the nitty-gritty details, uh, way beyond what is published in the scientific literature. Um, of course, the companies focus first on those bigger, bigger, um, uh, regulatory uh, areas, uh, and then they would go to to the smaller ones. Canada is typically relatively quick in getting getting attention because we have a, a robust healthcare system, and Canada. So, so Health Canada is often uh, not that far behind. In fact, Perfenidone was approved in Canada way ahead of the United States. Uh, and uh, almost in, in sync with the European Medicines Agency. Yeah, but mostly that's the reason why drugs are typically available earlier in the US than in Canada. Yeah, but I, you know, at the beginning of using Aspirate for patients with lung fibrosis, we had the interesting happening that a lot of patients from the US traveled north of the border to get drugs that they couldn't get in the United States. So sometimes happens the other way around too. But that, that's pretty much the reason for it. Dr. Cole, someone also wanted to know, um, why would they come out with a generic fibrotic? Why doesn't the original um, org company that created the drug, why don't they just lower the price after they've recuperated their, their research costs? 
So, um, let me, how do I answer that in a diplomatic way now? <laughs> uh, you would think that's, that's common sense and uh, companies would usually do that. Yeah, because as I said, the price of most of these drugs, not all, but most of the drugs is not because of what a single pill costs and the cost of making it and distributing it. The price is really because you have to do all these trials. Uh, so a patent protection is there to give someone a company that does all this research work a couple of years protected time to sell their drugs in a monopoly situation, just to make back some of the investment. That's absolutely fair. That's like with anything where you have a patent on. Now, Canada is, in my view, to some degree, unfortunately, favoring generics in all areas of medicine because of the cost. Uh, and I think in Quebec, if I'm not mistaken, for instance, once a generic is out on the market, the original, the brand and manufacturer is out. They just don't, they can't, they can't even, they're not allowed to lower the price because, because the, the system wants generics to be uh, in the market because they are cheaper. Uh, you know, from a government perspective, of course, I'd see the rational because it's less costly. But uh, you were wondering why Health Canada is later than the FDA. Of course, companies know that the environment is uh, not necessarily in favor of these novel brand name drugs. Um, and so it, it's for a company's perspective, not, not the best, the most fertile ground to, to get some of the revenue that they invested in. So, so I think it's, this is a, com it's a very complex question. Yeah, so um, in regards to um, Espriot, obviously the company was willing to reduce the price, but uh, something in the interaction between government and the company did not allow them to do it. Yeah, but they would have been very willing and we talked to them uh, to come down, and match, come down and match the price, but something did not allow that to happen. I hope that was diplomatic enough, but. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, Dr. Kobe. Okay, so, you know, I'm pretty much at the end here. So, so there is another one. And yes, people who were on Esprit know that Roche makes Esprit and they are still committed to this field. They have a lot of brilliant, good scientists and they are a very committed group of people in the inspiration program. And of course they were all, uh, uh, taken by surprise that they couldn't do what I just said, <clears throat> but they are they they bought the rights to this new uh, medication, which is an infusion, and this is currently tested in patients with IPF. Yeah, so that's what one of the trials where I said the smaller trial was promising, so they do a big one now. It's almost six hundred sixty patients that they aim to recruit. Um, takes a little longer to set this trial up because you need. To, to have ability to, to make an infusion, uh, which adds some complexity to a clinical trial. Um, but there are a number of sites in Canada that are uh, going to recruit patients, be in Hamilton as well, but in other sites in the Maritimes in British Columbia, Alberta, and uh, Quebec as well. So I think this is probably the, the biggest trial uh, that will allow patients to, to um, uh, to get enrolled in, in a large number of cities in, in Canada. Dr. Cope, um, yep. someone wanted to know if they are part of a clinical trial and they're on the drug and not the placebo, when the trial is uh, completed, are they able to stay on that drug? So that depends on the trial. So we have, uh, most trials would offer that option. So, um, because you know it's called an open label extension study. So, and and if if I'm working with a company and they ask me about, is that does it make sense to add this uh, period after the 52 weeks? I mostly say this makes a lot of sense. Yeah, for one, you do collect more safety information. 
uh, you will have a chance to see how does a patient do that was on placebo for a year and now is on the, on the drug. So if their slope of lung function changes after being on the real drug, that's an important signal for efficacy. It basically tells you, yes, this really works. And of course, patients are much more inclined to join such a trial because they know even if they got placebo for a year, after one year, they get the real drug. And if that real drug is approved eventually, in all cases that I have seen so far, the patients who were in the trials were on this drug uh, until the government reimburses it. So I think that there are most of these trials are offering this extension. Of course, if it does not work, if a trial is negative, then it would stop at some point. Yeah, but then, of course, you, you don't want to take something that doesn't work. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Cope, someone wanted to know if you can uh, maybe share a little bit more on the Roche um, clinical trial, the Starscape. Uh, yeah, so, uh, you know, this is, uh, this is a tr as I said, it's a big trial. Uh, this compound is called pentraxin. It's, it's, it's actually a in other words, it's called serum amyloid P. That's, that's a molecule that our liver makes. So it's so in a way um, an endogenous. So uh, it's a, it's a, if you want, it's a natural medicine because <laughs> the, the body makes this stuff. And we know that patients with fibrosis, not only IPF, but other types of fibrosis may not have enough of this stuff. Yeah? So the assumption is that this molecule is one of these uh, check checkpoints that tell scar forming cells, fibroblasts, that they should stop. And if you don't have this checkpoint in and you get disease because they don't stop, then you just give more of this checkpoint and then it stops. That's the thinking. I mean, it's a bit simplified, but that's roughly what it is. Yeah. So in, in a way, if you want, this is maybe not true natural medicine, but in a way, it's sort of uh, <laughs> more, more natural than the others. And the, 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 as I said, the tricky uh, element to this trial is that you need an infusion every three weeks, I believe. So, at, so the question before about, can you go to these trials if you live more remote? That might make it very difficult when you have to travel too far for an infusion every three weeks. Um, but uh, there are a number of these sites that are currently um, active. If it says not yet recruiting, that really just means they are still in the in the process of setting it up with paperwork and setting up the pharmacy. So, you know, you can imagine that this is quite complex. Yeah, because for an infusion, you need to make sure that uh, this blinding is guaranteed, right? So you need to prepare often in the, in the local pharmacy the, the infusion so that person obviously is not truly blind because they know what they mix in. And then he has to be packaged in tinfoil or whatever that, that no one sees what it is in there. And even the tubing that in an infusion typically is transparent. So you need to have the same kind of colored liquid that goes through this tubing when you get placebo versus the real trial. So it just, when it says not yet recruiting, it just means that these sites are still sort of in the process of being set up, but uh, usually they all have a list of patients who are interested and they would contact them. At, that's what we do. If you have interest in getting enrolled in any of these trials, you can also get to me through Sharon and I can try and help you. Thank you, Dr. Cope. Yeah, so I, you know, I'm, I think I'm pretty much at the end. So this is an, that's the fifth of the trials that will be recruiting patients in in uh, in Canada. Yeah, so there's only one site so far. Some other, because this is brand new. This I think that's the first patient in in this trial uh, will be randomized this week in the United States. So this is something very new. It's an oral compound as well, and uh, <clears throat> I'm actually coordinating this trial on a on a global level. Yeah, so there will be a few more sites coming to Canada hopefully. Yeah, but so so really those are the things that I wanted to share with you today about drug therapy, about the existing drugs and how to use them, how to manage them. I hope 
I was able to explain a little bit why these drugs are so costly. Yeah, so that this is not this is not a ripoff that the pharmaceutical companies want to make. It's really this is just how much it costs to 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 test these compounds. And uh, if if you don't offer an incentive to a um, to a drug developer, of course they would not invest resources in in creating new new medicines, which we need so so dearly, right? So, Dr. Pope, someone wanted to know, uh, because they have PF related to rheumatoid arthritis, they're taking a drug called rituxan, mm -hmm. and they're wondering, uh, should they go on profenadone or nitinidum as you had presented? So, uh, yeah, so rheumatoid arthritis is, uh, in our grouping, uh, a disease is called an autoimmune disease. So there is a bit of an autoimmunity problem that starts a rheumatoid arthritis. So if you have that, you know how kind of your joints shift, just flare up, are angry, painful, swollen, right? So there's a lot of inflammation and bad action going on. And if you treat this with anti-inflammation drugs, such as prednisone or rituximab, uh, that could subside. But uh, if you have long involvement with this, at some point, this inflammation is getting less important and scarring or fibrosis is getting more important. Now, this is not a sudden switch that next week you start to be fibrotic and last week you were inflammatory. It, it's a very gradual process. So in lots of situations, rituximab might be a very good choice because inflammation is a major element of why someone feels bad. At some point, antifibrosis medication might be a, a better choice. In a lot of patients, it would actually be an overlap. Yeah? So we would expect that a lot of these patients would have a time when they get both infl anti-inflammatory such as rituximab and anti-inflammatories uh, and only nintedonib is approved for it. Yeah, But you know, that brings us back to the government because both are expensive. So they may force us to pick one over the other, right? So which, which is, doesn't make sense from a doctor's perspective or a biology perspective, but from a payer and government perspective, of course, it makes a bit more sense. Oh, Dr. Cope, someone wanted to know, like if they were interested in being part of the clinical studies, uh, is it up to the respirologist to make that recommendation? How do they look them up and how do they say, I would like to be part of that or be considered? No, you can. I mean, you know, we would uh, welcome anyone in who is a reasonably travel distance to us to, to come and approach us. And, and so would any other site. Yeah, so, so we have, I mean, a lot of the people who are on the CPFF medical advisory board are typically involved in clinical trials at a larger scale. So Dr. Ryerson, Dr. Fell, Johansson, uh, Shapira, myself, uh, and um, Dr. Asayak and Mangana and, and Morissette in, in Quebec or Dr. Kantan, Sherbrooke. So, I mean, they are all on our advisory board. And if you are sort of in proximity to them, you could ask them and they would be able to direct you. I, I can, I mean, those are the trials that are recruiting in Canada. Uh, and uh, you don't need a referral for a trial. Yeah, so you, you, if you, if let's say if someone has an interest in doing a clinical trial comes to me, I would usually say, you know, I, I really need to make sure first that you have exactly the disease that is qualifying for that trial. So I would typically ask for a clinical assessment first. Uh, for that, I need a referral, but there would be no respirologist who would be ob objecting to uh, someone who wants to be in a clinical trial. So, you know, we had quite a few, uh, you know, Barbara Barr, who you may <laughs> will well know right, from the foundation. She worked for years uh, with endless power uh, for, for the foundation. Uh, she was living in the Toronto area, but we did a clinical trial that was not done in Toronto. So she traveled from Toronto to Hamilton all the time to get into this clinical trial. Yeah, so this, this is uh, something where you find that the Canadian uh, fibrosis doctors are very well connected and 
collaborated. Uh, Dr. Cope, someone wanted to know, what is a sort sojourn disease? Can this be because of IPF? You mean Sjogren's disease? Sjogren's, yes, sorry. So, so, yeah, so Sjogren's disease is also one of these disorders that we put into this autoimmune box. So it's in a large sense, a rheumatological disease. Uh, it affects uh, the joints less frequently. It's often causing kind of drying out of the, the salivary glands and the, the tears. So patients with Sjogren's often have kind of uh, very dry eyes, uh, painful, uh, they have dry mouth um, and they can get fibrosis in the lungs. So, and that fibrosis can sometimes look like IPF, sometimes it looks very differently. And someone who has Sjogren's disease has also a bit of higher risk to get lymphomas. So it, it's not IPF, but it can develop into a degree where it behaves like IPF in regard to the lungs. And, and we would then also be able to treat it with antifibrosis medication, but often it would be treated with um, other drugs before like anti-inflammatories. Yeah, typically would be um, mycophenolate or cyclophosphamide. Okay, uh, Dr. Cope, someone wanted to know, do these drugs uh, affect uh, males and females differently? Uh, you know, the drugs, not really. So um, the diseases are sometimes more often found in men or women. Yeah? So IPF affects men more than women. Scleroderma affects women more than men. Um, so, but the drugs would be very similar, no matter what gender. Okay. All right. And all these clinical trials, they're looking for both men and women, correct? Yes, yes. So yeah, they are all men Is there and women. An age limit. Um, well, often, like when you get, often they they stop at age eighty. Some some of them are older. Yeah, so it it's you know it's just that that these trials uh, want to avoid that a patient is enrolled with a lot of comorbidities. Yeah, so if you have other diseases that affect older folks. Uh, that could be someone who does not tolerate a drug that well or who has other problems that, that could interfere with the trial. But the typical age bracket would be between 18 and 80, sometimes sometimes older. But if, you know, these, these trial numbers that I put on here, uh, they all say exactly what age group is targeted. Yeah, but what is... A uh, practical question is some, some of these trials allow what we call standard of care. So they would test new drugs on top of what you're already on. So on top of OFEV or Aspirin. Uh, some others uh, would test them only in people who are not on any other antifibrosis drugs. So it's mostly like this one here, for instance, or ISON. That would be mostly a trial that uh, is for patients who tried the other drugs and didn't tolerate them, or that who have heard bad things about nintedonib and pyrfenidone and don't want to try them. Okay. Yeah, with that. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. Um, so I guess uh, someone wanted to know, do you think the, scar the Starscape drug trial could possibly make OFEV less effective? It's one of the things that will be um, that will be a part of the study uh, purpose, right? So um, the it, you know it's not very likely, yeah, you because know, the the that's that's part of what the tests would do prior to a trial being that big, yeah, that they already try to address those questions. It does. And there's, of course, a scenario where you say, well, a new drug, so an investigational drug does not go well with an existing drug. Yeah, and then you would say, well, it does not make sense to test this new drug then with the existing drug together. Yeah, because you may lose to find the signal. Yeah, so it's say if you have a drug A, which is new, 
and you combine it with a drug B, which is old, and the drug B has a 50% effect, and you take that away with drug A, so your drug A will look like doing nothing. Right, so so it, it it would not be in your interest to do that. Yeah, so they would have done that. Yeah, but they would always be conscious about safety, and they would constantly check for safety and drug drug interference alongside the the other trial outcomes. Thank you. I'm just going to ask my audience one more time. We're coming to the end of the hour. If anybody has any other questions, please post them in. Otherwise, um, I'm going to thank Dr. Cope for his wonderful presentation and all the new clinical trials that are coming up because it gives us a lot of hope and, um, and something to look forward to. So thank you very much. Yeah, no, I think it's uh, there's a lot of activity. And uh, I mean, as I heard before, uh, one of the uh, uh, audience said, that it's not only IPF that's correct. Yeah? So some of these trials are, are uh, either already looking for other types of pulmonary fibrosis or they will be looking for other types of pulmonary fibrosis. Yeah, so, so this one, for instance, they, they do a trial as well for scleroderma associated pulmonary fibrosis. And uh, some of these companies will look for diseases that have pulmonary fibrosis, but not IPF. Yeah? So it, it's, you know, it's just a matter of time. I, I know I, I, I said that before, and yes, if you're a patient looking at a bad prognosis and a patient who is in trouble for you, it can never be fast enough, uh, which is of course very unfortunate, but uh, you can be assured that people try their best to do this as, as quickly as possible, but in the sake of safety, it always takes time, right? So you can't really sacrifice uh, safety uh, for the sake of speed. Okay. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Cope. I really appreciate today. And everybody on the, the panel today that have attended, they've all said that they really appreciate everything you shared. Um, they have learned so much and they're, they feel very hopeful. That's good. So there's always hope and we keep fighting, right? <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Martin. Take care. Thanks, Sharon. Thanks all. Bye-bye.